morning, good afternoon, happy global tea break, happy Sunday, Sunday vibes. Come along and join us. All oh, the fun of the fair, a lovely Sunday afternoon. Ooh, let's see who's in. Hi everyone, thanks for coming in on this gorgeous day, taking your time to come and uh, do a little bit of tea breaking. Well today for me it's uh, water breaking. Uh, because it's too warm for a cup of tea, in my opinion. But anyway, how are we all doing today? Hope everyone's good. It is a Sunday fun day. Right, Caroline's in. Hi, Caroline. She's looking, hopefully, hoping for more chewed advance. No chewed advance today. No chewed advance today, I'm afraid. Right, let's get straight on with it. Um, in fact, let me just put a little comment so that we know um, who we are talking to. So my guest is my lovely... Locked, ooh, lockdown companion, Becky Clark on the City of London Churches. Picking up where we left off um, a couple of weekends ago. We left off after the Great Fire of London. Uh, and we are carrying on from there. So, as if by magic, there she be. Hello, everybody. So this is my colleague, uh, my colleague, my friend, not my colleague. That could be your colleague. My colleague. I basically work for you now. Yeah, she does. Yeah, yeah she does. Yeah. 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 Um, Terrible pay. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> she pays me. It's fantastic. She bought mini magnums, actually. I, take I did. I bought, yeah, carry on like that. You're not getting a mini magnum. Brilliant. Mate. Yeah. <laughs> not happening. Um, so this is Becky. So if you don't remember Becky or don't know who Becky is, uh, where have you been? Uh, this is uh, my lovely friend Becky, who is the director of churches and cathedrals for the Church of England. Did I get that right? You did. Check me. Um, so we did two weeks, um, two different Sundays, where we talked about the history of the churches in London. The first lot was from the year dot all the way up until... Uh, the Conquest. The Conquest, that was it, 1066. Um, and then the second week was from 1066 to 1666. Today is 1666 to 1966. Why not? Why not? I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll limp into the 20th Just gonna century. Just going to finish with football at the end. Yeah, yeah. There we go. So, um, where we left it, the Great Fire was roaring across London, coming in uh, towards the city of London, destroying uh, everything in its path, pretty much everything in its path. What's going to happen next? Yeah. So, five-sixths of the city, this is the city of London, we've got this map that we can show of the, the extent of the fire. Five-sixths of the city was laid waste to. Um, so within this area, it was from Fleet Street, if you know London, from Fleet Street in the west through to the Tower of London in the east. It was from the banks of the Thames right up to Cripplegate. And it was an enormous expanse of destruction. And there's, there's stories from the time, people saying that the ground was too hot to, to walk on. Yes, in fact, um, that when Laura Adams did her fabulous talk on the Great Fire of London, one of the things she talked about was animals with scorched paws. Oh, cats and dogs no. from homes because they, it was so hot they couldn't... Um, uh, they, they just couldn't uh, yeah, walk on the ground, just horrifying amounts of heat. And it's estimated about 65,000 people were left homeless from this um, and there were 87 churches destroyed in this, uh, along with obviously most of the houses around them, 13,000 homes are estimated to have been destroyed. Oh. And there is, yeah, there's, there's sort of stories of kind of smoking church towers because there were some of the few stone buildings. So they survived a bit better in some cases, but a lot of the time it was just the tower or just the outer walls that had survived. Um, now, the plans to start rebuilding came in almost instantaneously. It was incredibly quick. Mm. And, and, and various people were sort of invited to present their plans and various people who weren't invited nevertheless presented their plans as well. <laughs> Always happens, Absolutely, doesn't it? Yes. I know you didn't ask me, but here's my opinion. Here's my view on this. <laughs> yes, where could we possibly see that these days? Um, so, But Christopher Wren, as we know, he was the architect who sort of won out in, in some senses. But actually, Christopher Wren's plans were hugely extensive, far more extensive than... Um, was actually built and the reason was because there were so many vested interests at this point we talked about this in the last um, look at kind of how the churches and the history of the city went together the city of London was a power in its own right yeah it was like a yeah. powerful thing still there is huge amounts of vested interests you know an enormous amount of people who had money invested in things a lot of people didn't have fire insurance but people thought there was value in the land we had 6,000 people who were homeless, so we need to do something with them. Yeah. Um, Actually, fire insurance, quite interestingly, yeah. um, sorry to interrupt you no. quickly, but people don't always know about fire. Insurance hasn't always been around in the same capacity that it, it, it is today, but what used to happen is people, almost like a kind of protection racket, really, you would go along uh, to a house and say, look, you know, if you pay us some money, 
we'll put this plaque on the front of your house and if a fire comes along we'll look in the street and if your plaque's there we'll, we'll put out your house you'll be the one that we'll look after um, and you still see different fire plaques around London and it's kind of the first form of insurance isn't it but in a yeah. really rudimentary fashion and if any of you are big fans of the Discworld novels Terry Pratchett's Discworld in Ankh Morpork there's the famous one about why there's no city fire brigade because it basically involves a load of sort of burly men going around <laughs> folding their arms and saying oh it looks very flammable this uh, <laughs> might want to pay up I think that's taken from this early history of the city of London, sort of this yeah. fire insurance. Um, so yeah, so not, not a lot of insurance around. Uh, but the plans to redo um, everything, they really varied. So and some people said they wanted to have kind of a, a, a grid system. Some people wanted to have something that had lots of new big civic squares, lots mm -hmm. of big new public squares. But that's what Christopher Wren really wanted. He wanted boulevards, he wanted big public squares. Very French. Party very, French. very French. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen because... Um, not only was it forty French, yeah. it was also <laughs> not enough croissants. Far yeah. too many streets. It was also just not. Um, it was not compatible with what people needed to, to kind of get back out of the city. However, this effort did not go to waste. So here's a random fact: Richard Newcourt, who created one of the plans, and he was one of the big advocates for a grid system. Um, his rigid grid system, which had a church in every square, which we can pull up here. This is not a plan of London. This is, of course, a plan. Um, of well this is Philadelphia the city was actually planned using quite a lot of Richard Newcourt's original ideas for London amazing so this is what London might have looked like but practically but, was never gonna yeah was never gonna yeah but you know hey what we can't use America's very happy to take off yeah. our hands so you know um, we've got a couple of old prime ministers if you, if you want them as well you can I mean, have you them can too have the current one yeah, can have the <laughs> yeah really actually <laughs> no, no politics no, no politics all right we're, out. we're moving on <laughs> Two, 1667, so this is, only, this is only a year after the fire. Um, something called the Fire Court he Hearings started. Now, I don't know about you, there's this new Netflix series, which we have not watched because we are educated women, called Too Hot to Handle. I would rather have the Fire Courts. Didn't yeah. That cool? I'd cool. rather be caught in a fire, I think, actually. <laughs> That's also <laughs> true. But the Fire Courts were a, a set of hearings that heard um, people's land disputes and things like that. Um, and this is the point by the market started moving to dedicated halls. So what we've got a picture here of is, this is Spitalfields, current yes this is not 1600 spitalfields this no. is 21st century spitalfields um, spitalfields market was one of the market halls we have some sort of smithfields we have some sort of the other halls that moved to market halls at this point and this was a way of kind of gathering together in these new spaces so that is something that did change and did have one of your favorite shops is here isn't it well. yes mm. collective do vintage repro stuff Ooh. that's a story for another day yeah absolutely so we have these people moving to market halls and by 1670 so only three years um after the fire hearing started six thousand houses had been built um and most of the fire areas were completely rebuilt by 1676. Pretty quick, pretty swift, yeah. Ten years. Yeah. Well, and the exception to that was some of the church sites for various reasons, including the fact that there had been some replanning, but also that the church, we don't like to move fast at the best of time. <laughs> you know, you know make, it's how you survive for 1400 years, but yes. it's moving very slowly. Yes, they're currently there, all of their Zoom stuff. They just thought Zoom was a really quick pigeon, so that's how they're doing all yeah, of their well, online. Got some, some cans on yeah. string, really long pieces of <laughs> really long pieces string. string. I, tell me that doesn't work when the internet goes down, eh? Yeah. Um, so the guild also rebuilt we talked about the guild churches last time a lot of them rebuilt uh, again partly they just rebuilt in stone what was there but they had a huge amount of more decorative elements because you've got to remember what had shifted between the last really big period of kind of building in the city um, in the particularly the 13th 14th century and then some stuff following the dissolution of the monasteries was that there'd been a huge change in architectural style and you suddenly had this kind of classical style coming into the city so mm. Christopher Wren who he didn't may not have got his grand boulevards but he did get his churches yes. he built 51 churches rebuilt by Christopher Reddell under his kind of auspices um, and 23 of them are still intact today with a further six that are ruins or towers um, and that's sometimes ruins from the Second World War as well isn't it because yeah. um, obviously London was very heavily bombed and the population back then was a lot less due to um, well largely actually due to the Industrial Revolution where people sort of realised that they could live out and, and still work in the same area so the population massively goes down so we have a lot of destroyed churches um, yeah, which which just yeah. can't really. But anyway, so you, have, you, still, you can still see a lot of Wren stuff, and you will mostly when you see this stuff see very very um, typical classical stuff. However, this wasn't his only style. Here is the outside of St Mary Older Mary. That's the tower behind the building that it's in. If you go to the site of St Mary Older Mary, and Older Mary just means Older Mary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes it's simple. Yeah. Uh, the uh, it's meant to be one of the oldest churches dedicated to the Virgin Mary in the city. Um, this church was rebuilt by Wren. And it was rebuilt in a gothic style. So if we look at the inside of this, the no, inside is actually slightly better. That's there. phenomenal. That vaulting, absolutely Gorgeous. stupendous. 
um, an amazing church. It also has a really good cafe in the west end of the nave. It does. Free um, Wi-Fi. Yeah, free Wi-Fi. And people can go and sit in there, and lots of people do, go and sit in there and eat their lunch. Mm -hmm. um, the, there are pews available. You can go and, you know, take It's really pews. nice and quiet, and it's, it's kind of, it's just off a tiny little alleyway, so it's almost, it's it's not quite hidden, but it sort of is in that you wander past and you down yeah. this little street and you suddenly, oh, there's a church. And, yeah, And this is great. Like, if you're visiting London, this is like a, re this is a really good tip. These sort of little cafes you often get in churches, and we'll mention another one later, they're often really good. They're really unusual mm. and they are a sort of, you know, they're not going to be posh restaurant dining, but if you're looking for somewhere to sit and have have lunch or a coffee, put your feet up, yeah. 10 minutes. Not too expensive, yeah. good food. And you can, yeah. obviously, the other thing, you can just go and sit in the church for free and yeah. not buy a single thing and just yeah. enjoy the space. It's open every single day. Absolutely wonderful. So this is a sort of Renaissance Gothic peak and he did this deliberately. And Pevsner, who is an architectural historian, um, said that this was, you know, the pinnacle of Gothic architecture in London. Um, but, Martin, but by and large, Wren was, he was a classical architect, really, and what he really wanted to be building was a sort of modern version of Rome. Um, so, you know, he was Tough. The man of small ego. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what small ambition. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it, he obviously is most famous for his rebuilding of St Paul's Cathedral. And here is the plan that he had amidst. One of the plans. One of the plans. Now, there is a whole episode in St Paul's and the yeah. rebuilding that Wren did. Um, we're going to do it at some point. Which we will do. But he, he started at the East End in 1675. And interestingly, if you um, ever think about the building of churches, they're almost always started at the East End. And when I say the East End, mostly that's geographical as well. So if you happen, I don't know why, you'd have a compass on you. But if, if you did... I do. If you were a, I always if you're do. a good scout, yeah. be prepared. You can normally find which end I'm talking about by just pointing east. But they're not always that. And then it gets called what's liturgical east, which is basically where the high altar is. It's the holiest bit of the church and you always start building at the east unless there's something sort of you know there's a particular kind of problem yeah. site because it means you can kind of once you've got the altar in that area done you can start services while she's carrying on with the rest of it and that was the whole point yeah. so so paul's had services at the east end and in the queen's chapel and things before um it was built before yeah the end was built yeah. you know before the end was nigh. why not <laughs> portsmouth cathedral is probably my favorite in this so it's a, it's a 15th century um church the, the Portsmouth Cathedral absolutely beautiful, but the west end of it. So it started being built sort of you know six hundred years ago. The west end of it was finished in nineteen ninety four. Ah, so, you know we just just take us the odd nine hundred years or something to get. Well, you know there's still it. a cathedral being built in Barcelona. Yeah, so. now, they've only taken a hundred years on that so yeah, far. Have, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we've got this um, amazing design that Ren thought he was going to build. He as, said, as Alex says, he changed this three or four times. Mm. Um, and he was very secretive about his plans as well. Yeah. Didn't like anybody to know what he was going to. Because they kept telling him no. They did kept telling him no. And to be fair, at one point he was told explicitly not to build the dome yeah. that he did then build, <laughs> which is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, this is def this is uh, this is the mantra. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. It's the mantra of the Church of England. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what. You, whenever you see anything written in Latin, you think it's something really holy. It's not. It's just that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we've got this amazing sort of classical um, uh, amount of buildings being put into the city, into these spaces. Um, at St Paul's, the last of the Inigo Jones design, which was the original, or sort of the preceding St Paul's, which, which Ren says he loved. Actually. Did he? Yeah, he really admired it. He really regretfully removed the last of it in 1688. And the cathedral, as we know it, more or less, was finished mm -hmm. in 1711. Um, carved stones from various churches that had burned down were reused, partly as rubble for the foundations of St Paul's and some other buildings, but also some of them set into the walls. And, and there's infill, isn't it? The walls are sort of a bit like... Um well walls in, in houses today and that they're sort of two walls and they, they put all the old bits yeah. of the old St Paul's Cathedral as infill in those walls kind of rubble so it's still there even yeah. if it's not in a yeah. uh, sort of standing piece if you like it's particularly good as, as ballast it's sort of a little crypt to keep got a very big building on top I of it I like a bit of ballast <laughs> yeah I like a bit of ballast absolutely so the new spaces I mean the thing is this is not just about architectural history this is also about why this was happening you know Wren was trying to build something that was very very new and very very classical and very kind of um, huge, although it wasn't going to be quite as long as the old old St Paul's, but was going to be a statement for the city in its new guise. But the thing about architecture is it gives space for a lot of other stuff as well. So the new churches that were being built gave an enormous space for the development of art. And for example, we have some amazing master craftsmen who, and I'm afraid they, are, they were and are men at this period as yeah, well. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. But Grinling Gibbons, who if anybody knows about history, will have come across Grinling Gibbons. He designs various things, including this. Now, I, sh I should actually say at this point, so any guides, when we trained, in my year anyway, um, whenever they said, who carved... Everyone would just go, Grinling Gibbon! 
hands because he's pretty much the only carver you're aware of and he's pretty much carved everything so he, it's a lot of fun to be fair he's carved a lot of stuff yeah he's carved a lot of stuff um, it's, it's amazing and whether you like this or not in terms of architectural style the, the it's all completed in wood it's an incredible thing so he yeah. designed this which is the font cover at all hallows by the tower he also just designed the choir stalls which are still in situ at st paul's so you can see how this kind of very ornate over the top this sort of a beautiful burst of baroque Beautiful burst of baroque. Can I say that after a couple of gins? Absolutely. Um, which comes into the city, you get these kind of this theme coming in, changing the interior and the exterior of not just church buildings, but how people kind of appreciate and understand their relationship with God when they come in and worship. It's no longer this um, quite quiet, quite austere. You must focus on you know, prayer and on your kind of solitary um, interactions and listening to the Eucharist. It becomes more exuberant. It becomes lighter. It becomes uh, a very different kind of place to be and therefore a different kind of worship. So it's interesting in terms of the social history of, of how people kind of were yeah. working within these sort of boundaries. Um, other decorative features that started to be put on, they had always been there, but there's some really good ones from this particular period, are weather vanes. <gasps> now, love a weather vane. I love a weather vane. So you've got, cock, you've got a cockerel at St Dunstan's, you've got a boat at St Nicholas's. This is, if you're ever around with kids looking, or actually just you know people who are kid-like, like us, yeah. Yeah, you can just look at the weather vanes, there's some really fun ones. Um, but my, one of my favourites is the dragon. One of my favourites as well. I love a dragon. Yeah. Here we go. The dragon is on. Oh, tell you what. Ooh. Let's ask the guides. Guides, where is this dragon? There's a clue. Well, I mean, not, not much of a clue in fairness, but is where is this dragon? Guides can chime in. Um, We're going to take a drink. We're going to take a drink. Take a, drink. a long drink. <laughs> what can you tell us about the dragon while the guides uh, so catch up with us? The, the dragon has got the, uh, the red cross of the City of London. You can see there. Um, and this is a very famous church. Anyone know what it is? Mary LeBeau! Thank you, Emily! Well done, Emily. Yes, so this is St. Mary <laughs> LeBeau. Um, and the... So Mary LeBeau is featured in so much folklore. It was for a long time, and in some circles still is, considered the sort of second city of city church to St. Paul's. Um, mm. To be a true Cockney, you have to be born within the sound of bow bells. Yeah. And this is not... People always think it's bow in the east end of London. No. It's not. It's this one. It's this one. Um, which is, you know, currently it's near one new change. So if you're in the yep. city and you're, if you're off a, a cocktail on the rooftop. Who isn't? Who isn't? I mean, not not now. No. No. Very, don't, yes. don't stay don't, don't do that. Don't, no. No. Yeah. No. But you can obviously go and, and uh, see this church. Again, open certainly every day of the week. Um, and it does have services at the weekends as well. Fun fact about that one. I don't know if he's still there, but their, um, their reverend used to be the Reverend George Bush. Yeah. Fun fact. No relation. No, no relation, nor, nor the same person, I believe. Um, so we've got this church. It's featured in things like, in Dick Whittington, it's the sound of Bow Bells that calls him back into the city from Highgate. He hears the bells kind of... And his names are on the bells. Yeah. In the church as well. There's one letter on each bell, isn't there? And it spells out Dick Whittington. It also features in the um, the poem Oranges and Lemons, so the bells of St. Clement's. Correct. And bow is in there. People, the, the, so the bow is not named after anything to do with fabric or anything to do with archery or anything like that. It's because the arches within the church, the original church, were seen as bows, sort of yeah. stone bows. Particularly in the crypt. And they're yeah. still there. The crypt, again, lovely Amazing. cafe in the crypt. Yes. Um, and they have these lovely bowed arches, which is where it gets its name from. Yeah, so you've got the, the, the actual bells that were um, put in after the fire by, by Wren's architects and Wren's builders were destroyed in an air raid in the Blitz. Oh! Uh, but there are bells there still. They still ring out. They do. Um, there's been a church on this site. This is going back to our, our original talk about how you're actually doing a bit of sort of archaeology. It's been a church on this site since Saxon times. Mm -hmm. so, and, and we should actually say about the thing about Cockneys and being born within the sound of the bow bells. Of course, that's back in the day when you don't have the traffic and the noise that you have today. So it's very hard to, to hear the bells from very far away. But so there's now a designated area which covers the area that they would have been heard in. That yeah. if you are, yeah. Glad to know that's regulated by oh, yeah. someone. Got, everything's got to be regulated. Yeah. So if you want to be a true Cockney, that is, yeah, you can kind of look that up and see. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, the, the original version of this church, again, there have been multiple churches on this site. I liked this. It was destroyed in 1091 by the Tornado of London. That oh, sounds amazing. Yeah. Love a tornado. Oh, absolutely. Especially a London one. It's a bit pathetic. It comes in and goes, do you mind? And as Alex says, there is a very good um, cafe called Cafe Below in the crypt yep. which is well worth a visit the crypt itself is amazing there is a crypt chapel which if you ask they'll often let you in to see sometimes it's just open for visitors which i think is one of the most beautiful spaces in london Do you know i don't know if i've been in there actually it's just through a door through the cafe i think i only got as far as the tea and cake that's fair it's very good we should do a tea and cake tour of the church cafes of the city of london tea cake and crypts tea cake and crypts boom who's on board coffee coffee cake and crypts yeah i like it 
<laughs> so we move now. So we've got this. We've got this classical rebuilding, which is the 17th into the 18th century. There's an awful lot of churches built. By the time we get to the 19th century, architecture is changing again. But so are people. Now, Alex has already mentioned the Industrial Revolution. This really is shifting the economic basis of the whole of the country. Yeah, you know, it is as much as that. It is. Yeah. It is the biggest change that you see. Um, I think the only thing that really compares to it in the modern world in terms of completely transforming how people work is the internet. Yes, yeah. Um, but, but the Industrial Revolution, you know, it was a sort of it was a visceral thing. I served in, I, I did a, a course in uh, Ironbridge, which is a world heritage. I was going to say you served during the Industrial Revolution. Yes, I, I was like, did. how old are you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was there, I was in the Ironbridge when the, um, doing this course and we were talk, looking at how the landscape would have looked and all these things. The Industrial Revolution completely transformed the whole of England. It had a massive effect um, on uh, the city of London as well. Uh, so into the 19th century, and you start to get, particularly into the Victorian period, less of the building in the city and more of the growth of the suburbs. Now, if you've been to London or if you live in London, you know it, you will know that the Victorian suburbs are vast. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. I mean, they're most of London. Yes, they kind of, it just expands and sucks all these little villages into it. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So they start to get these churches which are, are supporting these new populations. So you get this one, for example, which is St. Augustine's Kilburn. Pointy. Pointy. This was an area of really, Tall and pointy. This was an area of really high um, Irish immigration. And this was an attempt by the local Anglican population to not lose their um, congregants to the Catholic heresy. Ah, uh, ooh. Just got to remember this is, Yeah, absolutely. So you see St. Augustine's Kilburn, which is an enormous, it's called the Cathedral of North London. Um, it is very tall and pointy. It is very tall and pointy. Uh, it was built by an architect called John, John Loughborough Pearson, who is well worth looking up because he designed a lot of really interesting churches. Yeah, it's a great church. See, the, the, the people are sort of saying they like this church. It's wonderful. And it's a, you know, it's a local church in some senses, but it's actually symbolic of this huge kind of rebuilding of the Anglican architectural style, which had become quite atrophied. Um, it's, it's an extent. There isn't a lot of very good um, Baroque 18th century stuff. And into the 19th century, you suddenly get this kind of, oh, no, actually, what we're going to do is rebuild it. Yeah. Victorians got everywhere. There is barely a church in England that doesn't have some level of Victorian intervention <laughs> in it. They like messing with stuff, didn't uh, they? They kind of went in and went, oh, that looks not what I like. I'm just going to stick this massive big old thing over the yeah, top. Yeah, or take things out. Yeah. They were going into kind of what they thought antiquity should look like. Devils. Um, but there I mean, there's obviously some amazing um, Victorian interventions and they did save a lot of churches, but we could do a, a whole thing on this. And there are some amazing <laughs> organisations like the Friends of Friendless Churches who look after some very ancient churches which were not particularly uh, messed around with, um, to use a pejorative phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Just hope nobody from the Victorian society is watching. If they're not. Uh, if, if they are, sorry. Yeah. So, but you also you have amazing other churches. You have things like this, which is St Cuthbert's Earl's Court. I look at that. Love that. It's just Beautiful. A, you know, never, uh, never knowingly under decorated. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Extraordinary place. Um, How much is too much bling? There is not enough. No, not, yeah. not such a thing as yes. too much bling. So you've got this incredible rarados sort of thing behind the altar that goes right up the east wall. You've got this amazing, you know, pointed arcades. You've got all this incredible decor. So you can go and see these churches. These still, uh, still exist. Still very active. This one, of course, is a massive sort of arts and crafts interior. In the city, it was much more about rebuilding than new building. So St Mary Older Mary, which we saw earlier, actually the picture that we saw was of it was after the Victorian reconstruction. They took out a big oak screen, various mm -hmm. other things. So although you do get this wonderful Gothic and they didn't really mess with that, um, you have had interventions in the, in the 19th century. Um, there are exceptions to this rule about no rebuilding, and you do get things like this, which is St Alban the Martyr in Hoburn. Which looks really cool, I quite like it. Like a stripy church. Yeah. A stripy church. Um, so this is a... It's like a cake in brick. <laughs> this was built by William Butterfield, which is another one, along with John Loughborough Pearson, another one of these great sort of Victorian architects, 1861 to 62. Um, the, it was fascinating because the first priest, he sounds like quite a character, he, he decided that this modern church, these modern people, he was going to introduce Gregor Gregorian chant. Wow. Yeah. It's quite the choice. Yeah. No, it was bold. <laughs> yeah, um, pretty bold. Yeah, it's one of the first churches apparently to celebrate a harvest festival in a sort of fully liturgical Aww. way as well. Yeah, I don't know why it would be tins of beans and and you know old tins of kidney beans. And oh, like that's, that. that's a that's a childhood in oh, isn't really, it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so it, this is amazing. So you do get these kind of Victorian um, churches, but there's fewer of them being built new in the city and a lot more being built out in the suburbs. Um, and of course, the Victorian period saw this huge expansion of London. We've talked about. With that came south of the river, the creation of a new diocese. South of the river. South of the river. We can venture just south of the river to talk about Southwark Cathedral. 
Da -da -da. So now, if anyone's been to London and been to Borough Market, uh, which is a foodie haven in, in London, um, Southwark Cathedral is kind of scooched right into the middle of the market, and you almost don't even see it when you're wandering around looking at sausage rolls and donuts and what have you. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful cathedral. Yeah. Yeah, and after you've paid five pound fifty for a gourmet sausage roll, you can uh, you go. So go repent for your sins, will you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's free. It's free. Yay. So it's, it's fascinating. London has two cathedrals. People often think that Westminster Abbey is a cathedral. It isn't. A cathedral is the seat of a bishop. Yes. And there's only one per diocese, which is sort of equivalent of this. It's Church of England's equivalent of regional offices. Yes. 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 Yeah, that'll do. Um, so we've got these two dioceses within London, and the Diocese of Southwark was only created was out of the Victorian period, but it, it was 1905 and it became a diocese in its own right with its own bishop, its own cathedral. The um, There has been a church on this site, however, since Saxon times, yeah. and it's attested as a priory since the Norman times. Oh, Diane uh, is one of my colleagues. She says, when I went last week into St Alban the Martyr, they had a sign up explaining why they weren't going to recognise a female Bishop of London. Yeah. Do you know why? What was their explanation for it? Oh, well, they, so Too some... many boobs for the congregation. <laughs> very Vicar of Dibley, isn't it? The, um, <laughs> yes. That's on Netflix now. That is on Netflix. I've just binge watched oh, the whole no. of Vicar of Dibley. Vicar of Dibley. Yeah. Between that and Rev, you can find out all you need to know about the modern church in England. <laughs> yes. Um, some of the churches in I mean, various dioceses and some congregations have always felt, um, you know, with a sincere and theological belief I do not agree with, yeah. um, that the uh, biblical context for priesthood is entirely male and that is stated and that is something they believe. In not recognising a female Bishop of London, um, they are obviously making a statement about their own particular interpretation of faith in the Bible. They therefore get oversight from a, uh, a male bishop, uh, normally a suffragan bishop, so it's a kind of deputy bishop who will okay. deal with them. So um, it's it's in a spirit of what the Archbishop of Canterbury calls good disagreement, which I think... <laughs> okay. Well, it's a difficult thing, though, isn't it? I think these days we tend to think if somebody doesn't have the same view as us and they're not willing to kind of be persuaded, then they're probably wrong and we're right. So it's trying to get out of that kind of slightly zero-sum argument. But yeah. needless to say, not my view. Anyway, yes. we've, we've got back into politics again. Let's get we out, have. out of politics. Yes. Back into history. Can't stop her swerving into politics. Oh, dear. It's a nightmare living with her. Absolutely. I can only imagine. Yeah. She keeps um, bringing up the poll tags. Any chance given, it's a nightmare. I just, we shouldn't pay it. <laughs> we shouldn't. Get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> so Southern Cathedral is a beautiful cathedral um, and is enormously inclusive as a church, incidentally. So, you know, all are definitely, definitely welcome there. They were one of the first cathedrals to hold a service of kind of recognition for LGBTQ communities. And actually, we should say, um, after yesterday's chat on Shakespeare with Simon, um, there is a Shakespeare link in Southern Cathedral, yes. which is that we think, we don't know for definite because we have no uh, concrete evidence, uh, but we think that he used to go and worship there. The reason we think that is because the Globe is about five minutes walk down the river and his brother used to ring the bells at Southwark Cathedral and is buried in the cathedral itself. So they do have, they, they've gone with it, they've lent into it. They have a fantastic window, stained glass window mm. in there to Shakespeare, which has everything from the Tempest to the Seven Ages of Man, it's fantastic. And then a sculpture or kind of memorial to him underneath where people go and leave like little flowers and things and, and rosemary, um, as Simon was saying yesterday about remembrance. Yeah. Um, so just a little side note, if you are there in Borough Market for um, uh, you know a bit of a, a munch for lunch, then head into the cathedral and go and have a look at the Shakespeare window, yeah, amongst other things. Go and look at the whole church because it's absolutely amazing. So also you've, that you've got <laughs> just just incidentally, <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> you've got bits from the eleventh century um, in the form of an arcade at the west end, which has been built into the wall. You have a bit of Roman mosaic, which was yeah. discovered under the site, which is now in front of one of the sets of steps on the um, south side. You have got various fantastic bits of architecture, some great stained glass, um, mm -hmm. some wonderful monuments, not just to Shakespeare. There's also, there's half of a cadaver tomb. I love a cadaver tomb. You know about these? I don't know about these. Oh what my these? gosh, this is what I, when I die, and I might, um, the, um, <laughs> probably not going to make it out the, 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 I want a cadaver Covid doesn't take her, I will. <laughs> they were very, they were very popular for a short period, about 150 years, in certain sort of circles. And basically you would have a skeletal form. Oh yes, I do know what you mean. Yeah. I just didn't know what that, that was called. Sorry, carry on. So sometimes you get them with two levels. We have somebody on the top, you know, body on the top, which is kind of the person in robes as you might you know, you recognize from a sort of medieval monument and then underneath you'll have this kind of skeleton or in some cases you've got ones that actually have beetles kind of going yeah. into the eye sockets and things and it was all this memento mori you know remember from you know dust you come and from dust you shall return stuff yeah. but they're they're rather gruesome fun. fantastic bit of a reminder Yay. of our own mortality 
That's cheery. Yay. Carry on. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so 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 Southwark becomes a cathedral in the in the um in the 1900s in 1905. But before that in the Victorian period it had been substantially rebuilt because it had been massively neglected for ages. Really poor part of London and money really only started coming into it um with the industrial revolution but actually quite a lot later as well. It was felt that there was needed to be a cathedral on this site, partly to help the populace to behave as sort of good Christian citizens. As they should. Well, yes, no, it, it's obviously worked. Yes. Yes. We live south of the river. It's our cathedral. It, it is. Yep. And we are perfectly upstanding members of society. We are. So, proof that that works. Yeah. Um, is it well worth going and having a look at Southern Cathedral? Uh, uh, but partly you can think about it in terms of this, this rebuilding that happened in the Victorian period and then also well into the 20th century to make it into a modern church. A lot of what you see on the surface now is Victorian, but if you look carefully, you can see the kinks and the wonks where they didn't quite try and, they couldn't quite fit the new I thought you were talking about the band from the 60s then. I've never heard of the wonks. <laughs> we couldn't, Sorry. It's a tribute band. It's a tribute band to the kinks. A tribute band to the kinks called <laughs> the wonks. Would see. Yes, 10 out of 10, we'll yeah. go to that gig. Would yeah. go to that gig. <laughs> Anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, you could go and see where the building that they put in and the rest restoration they did didn't quite fit in with the medieval floor pattern. And you do see this kind of layer upon layer. You've got, med you've got you know, conquest era architecture. You've got medieval monuments. You've got 19th century buildings. You've got 20 and 21st century architecture to the side where they've got a new cafe and shop and things like that. So you have this amazing panoply. Now, until um, it became a diocese in its own right in 1905, uh, Southwark was part first of Winchester Diocese and then briefly of Rochester Diocese. But Winchester Diocese was enormously powerful. This is the Palace of Winchester. It's about two, three minutes walk from, no, if that, from the cathedral around the corner. This yeah. is what remains. Um, and it's fascinating. And actually, if you look around this area, this is on something called Clink Street. But the, if you look around here, it's places like Winchester Row. There are a lot of names that make reference to um, the bishops, bishops of Winchester and the Diocese of Winchester. It was huge and it was powerful. Yeah. And Winchester Palace was their London seat. Yes. So you. Have Which Winchester is is the city that I sort of come from, and it's about on now it's about an hour west of yeah. London on the train. So it's not close, no. um, but this is where their jurisdiction came up to. And they were not the nicest, were they? Do we want to talk about the Winchester geese? Well, we can talk about the Winchester geese a bit. Yes, this is out of our period, but um, the Winchester geese were a group of women who. Well, do you, do you want to explain the sort of history of what you know about them? Well, um, the, from my understanding, the Winchester geese were basically um, uh, women who sold their bodies for money. Um, and the bishops of Winchester kind of acted like pimps. They took a, a portion of whatever they um, they made. Uh, and then, of course, when the women didn't work anymore or died, they didn't want anything to do with them. And there is a, a little graveyard just around the corner called Crossbones Graveyard, which is an unconsecrated graveyard, which is where a lot of these forgotten and fallen women were buried. So it's all kind of, you know, pretty grim and grisly at this time. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a huge history of what's going on here, and that that is a very dark part of it. Um, mm. And But you do get this, I think, you know, Winchester was a powerful diocese, power tends to corrupt. It's yeah. not, you know, not always a good history. And that's why I think it's interesting. That's why I love churches, because actually this isn't a history of architect architecture, it's a history through architecture. Um, and you can really see the development of society. You can see it's the way it interacts with the various different parts of society, particularly poorer members. Sometimes it's treatment of women and other marginalised groups. Mm -hmm. You can see the history of art and design yeah. through these buildings. Um, and so this brings us into the 20th century with the creation of the Diocese of Southwark. There is another major, major change that goes on, which is the Blitz. Now, I'm not actually going to talk very much about the Blitz and its impacts because they were huge. I mean, they were devastating. The city, understandably, along with the Docklands, which is you know where we currently are, hugely bombed um, mm. because they were defensive targets. The Blitz was devastating to people's lives and the architecture was a fallout from that. But the targets were really the buildings, not the people. Yeah. Um, however, when the city came to rebuild after the Blitz, with some exceptions, they decided to rebuild almost all on the footprints of and often in the style of what had been there before. And there was this feeling that in their case, they wanted to rebuild in a style that was recognised and kind of kept that historical link. That's a decision that was made. And I think that, you know, it's beautiful for it. If you go to city churches, they're amazing. Somewhere like mm. Coventry, which was also bombed in the Blitz, took a very yeah. different approach. Yeah. They decided to build something completely new, one of the world's best 20th century buildings yeah. uh, in the form of the new cathedral at Coventry. Whereas in Dresden, which was equally bombed by the Allies, they decided to rebuild exactly as it had been. Yeah. So, so yeah, different approaches for, for different cities, yeah. which is quite interesting. Um, and we will maybe at some point look at some little curios in the city of London, like some of the old churches um, that were are now apartments. Um, we might have a little look at that at some point, yeah. but that's, uh, I think, a, a chat for another day, isn't it? I think it is. So, yeah, yeah. so we, we're brought into the 20th century. 
and um, we've seen that churches really, they, you know, they were always part of life. You can do these sort of historical surveys through them. Um, you can find out about the people who lived there and what they did and how they were kind of related to each other by exploring the churches. And you can also get cake and a coffee on the way. Yay! What could be better? That's what we like. Which is, I think, what we're going to go and do now, isn't it? Very much so. Um, thank you all for joining. I've just noticed someone's asked so many names. Are there notes somewhere? They're, we don't do notes in these talks, no. They're just very kind of ad hoc ones. But I will post this afterwards. You can watch it back and sort of stop it and take the notes that you like. Um, any sort of good reference places? Well, I would say if you want to look at architectural history, um, Pevsner, Nicholas mm. Pevsner, wrote a series of architectural guides, which are really the classics. However, they're incredibly detailed. They so to be honest, if you're trying to look for something, there are some very good books on the churches of the City of London, which are, have fantastic illustrations. And that's the key that you need, really, is to mm. try and be able to identify visually the things that are being talked about. So I don't yeah. know about you, if I just read a whole load of prose, I find it much harder to make it stick than yeah. if somebody gives me a picture and I can go, oh, it's that. Yes, exactly. So, so exactly. I think, I, you know, I can think of some, we can maybe post um, links later, but there's lots and lots of stuff out there and some amazing people. There are. And um, one of my colleagues, I don't think she's watching today, she probably isn't, um, Fiona, she is a member of a thing called the Church Watchers. So in the city of London, there's a group of people and they basically go around and sit in the churches, which means that the churches can be open and that pretty much every day of the week you can go around and there's somebody there uh, so that the church is open, you can wander in and have a look. And there are some fantastic little curiosities yeah. in so many of them, which I think might be a little chat for another day. I think so. Because yeah. there, there is an awful lot. I mean, at the moment, the other thing that's to say, obviously, at the moment, all the churches still are shut. Yes. And they're shut because of lockdown. And the last time we told Her you... decision. It was, it, was, it was the government's decision. <laughs> completely support. Well, you know. <laughs> some of the churches have moved some of their most valuable things that would normally have been cared for by people like the church watchers into the Tower of London. Into the Tower of London, yes. So it's, it's fulfilling its original purpose of being a kind of keepsake fortress, yeah. fortress for London still today. So it just goes to show that it, actually we can just sum up British history in one line, which is never throw something out because you might need it later. Yes. Yes. And on that note, we're going to love you and leave you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to post the menu for next week's uh, Global Tea Breaks later on today. Um, this will be available for 24 hours of my stories and then I'll post it at some point. I'm having loads of internet issues at the minute, so I'm quite behind on posting. Please don't shout at me. It is what it is. Um, if anyone <laughs> can give an internet company a bit of a shove in the face, that would be lovely. Um, and tomorrow we're going to be back for Monarch Mondays. And I'm just putting the finishing touches to all of next week's ones, so I will publish the menu and you can see you later. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. See you tomorrow at three. Happy Easter Bye. weekend. Happy weekend. Bye. Bye. Bye.